Tribune. 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 Tribune de l'ULB. Un point de vue. Un débat. Mr. President, Your Excellency, Mr. Director, Mr. The Vice Rector, Mr. The Vice President, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. As President of the Institute for European Studies of the Université Libre de Bruxelles, I wish to welcome you all to this conference devoted to the EU-Japan relationship and organized by the EAA in partnership with the Tribune de l'ULB and with the support of Vazeda University and the Wiener Onspacht Foundation. It's my pleasure to invite Mr. Didier Vivier, Rector of the ULB, for an introductory speech, and we will then listen to His Excellency Ambassador Kaishi Katakami, Head of Mission of Japan to the EU, as well as to Professor Morita, Vice President for International Affairs from Vazeda University. Thank you. Excellency, I would say, dear neighbor, because uh, from the window of my office, I have a perfect view on your splendid house. And so, dear President van der Rompuy, dear colleagues and friends, please allow me in honor of both of both our guest speaker and the long-standing partnership between Europe and Japan to start this opening remarks by quoting uh, IQ, but uh, IQ by President Van Rompuy himself, describing the strategic partnership between Tokyo and Brussels. I quote, people far away, but sun and stars on our flags belong together. If spoken in 2013, these lyrical words still hold true as the EU-Japan partnership is as solid, as strong as ever. Both parties remain committed toward, toward securing the considerable potential for further cooperation on bilateral regional and global matters, and with this in mind, European and Japanese officials have worked tirelessly since two and 2013 towards securing a strategic partnership agreement covering political cooperation and an ambitious free trade agreement to deepen ex existing trade and investment relations. These ongoing negotiations are obviously of great significance and their outcome will shape the relationship for years to come. It is in this rapidly evolving and encouraging context that officials from both sides are set to meet at the 23rd EU-Japan summit to be held in Tokyo a little under a month from now. The timing of this public debate and the publication of the edited volume on the European, that's the title, the European Union and Japan, a new chapter in civilian power corporations, are therefore quite opportune as they offer a chance to explore a crucial, if at time little known, relationship. And this just as the partnership seeks to redefine itself in response, of, in response to new challenges. In accordance with the ULB's long-standing tradition of public debates, today's conference, as well as the latest published volume in the GEM book series, seek to reconcile the long-term analytical perspective necessary to any academic endeavor with the more immediate imperatives of the political agenda. The academic research underpinning today's debate is part of the Institut d'études européennes, Institute for European Studies, pluri annual exploration of the EU's evolving external action. This interdisciplinary research agenda 
supported by various programs, such as the Green Integrated Research Project or the Erasmus Mundus GEM PhD School, as amongst other, seen the EAA, developed joint research on the EU-Japan partnership together with two of the ULB strategic partners, Vazeda and Oxford University. Both partner institutions are represented here today. And I would like to take this opportunity to welcome, to welcome them and comment the numerous projects linking our respective institutions. In this respect, special mention is to be made of the continued commitment of both our counterparts at Vazeda University, represented here today by Professor Norimasa Morita, uh, Vice President for International Affairs, as well as the Fondation Wiener Hanspax, unwavering support for collaborations between ULB and Oxford or even Cambridge, I have to say, University. Moreover, conferences scheduled as part of the Tribune de l'ULB cycle are also a contribution to the public debate on key issues of the day, where both the university community as well as the public at large can profit from informed and frank talks given by outstanding figures combining practical and academic knowledge. In this respect, considering both its first-hand experience of the inner workings of European decision-making at the highest levels and its prominent role in the launch of the current round of hybrid interregional negotiation involving Japan and the EU, we are honored and delighted to welcome President Emeritus van der Rompuy as today's speaker. If I will leave to Professor Armut Meyer the task of providing some more background information on the EU-Japan partnership and the leading role President van der Rompuy played in his most recent chapter, I would want to thank President van der Rompuy for his sustained engagement with the academic world, his many thoughtful contributions, be it as lecturer or speaker, continue to bring, to, to bring the Europe, un, European Union closer to its citizens, as they invariably offer interested parties a rare insight into the workings of the uniquely ambitious political project that is the European Union. To conclude, before giving the floor to Ambassador Katakami, who we are all equally honored to welcome within the walls of the university, I wish to thank those people who made today's event possible. On one hand, from the Institut d'Etudes Européennes, Professors Weyenberg and Coman, but also Mr. Robrecht and Vierze, and on the other hand, all those collaborators involved in the organization of the Tribune de l'ULB, it is indeed through the continued efforts of all the components of its community that the Université Libre de Bruxelles strives to meet its standing as a truly European university. I thank you, and I'm giving the floor to you, Excellency. Thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, Mr. President Van Lompai, Dr. Mayor, professors, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening to every one of you. It is a great honor to be here tonight at this important conference and to help celebrate this new book on the EU-Japan partnership. This new book which we will learn more about later from Professor Mayer, 
and tonight's conference, examining the future of the Japan-EU relations, comes at a particularly appropriate time. Japan and the EU have been working closely together, and in the long history of our strong relationship, I believe that we are now at a pivotal juncture. We are now negotiating to finalize two comprehensive agreements, an economic partnership agreement, EPA or FTA, and strategic partnership agreement, SPA. We have stated our intention that the EPA and SPA be concluded in principle by the end of 2015. I echo that goal here this evening, as I believe these two agreements will bring our relation to the next stage, consolidating and strengthening them as we move forward. The Japan-EU EPA will promote trade and investment on both sides through the elimination of tariffs and improving trade and investment rules. It will boost economic growth, create employment, and strengthen business competitiveness, both in Japan and the EU. It will also promote inroads into the Japanese market by European companies. An economic partnership agreement between two of the world's most advanced market economies, I should say, excuse me, advanced market economies, will also contribute to stable growth in the world economy and global rules and standards setting in trade and investment. The SPA, Strategic Partnership Agreement, encompasses the entire relationship and promotes substantial cooperation on a wide variety of areas. I'm encouraged to observe the constantly expanding horizon of cooperation and collaboration in the area of international diplomacy and security, as well as cooperation in the area of space, ICT, and cybercrime, to name but a few between Japan and EU. As two like-minded and value-sharing partners, it is crucial that we provide a solid legal foundation on which to base our relationship. These two agreements, the EPA or FDA and SPA, are not only beneficial for Japan and EU, but they will be the tools with which Japan and the EU can positively affect global dynamism and provide answer to our common challenges. Putting the ongoing negotiation aside, let me draw your attention to the fact that this established relationship is also the result of continuous commitments and engagements at the leader's level. This constant, high-level engagement has been the entire engine of our growing cooperation and has been providing the necessary momentum to move our relation to the next stage. Undeniably, tonight's distinguished keynote speaker, President Herman van Rompuy, who was the very first president of the European Council, was always open to Japan and held numerous productive and fruitful meetings with Japanese leaders. He worked tirelessly to help drive forward ever-growing Japan-EU relations. We are very grateful, Mr. Fan Lumpai, for your dedication to promote, the strength, promote and strengthen Japan-EU relations. In your capacity as a president of the European Council and upon your departure, I believe that you have left a yellow brick road for us to continue working on. I'm confident that what you have left for us will help us to conclude both the EPA or FTA and SPA. This will lead Japan and the EU to be ever 
closer partners in a globalized world. I would like to finish by saying that I sincerely hope to see Japan and the EU reach a new level in our relations, but that this cannot be achieved only through political leaders' continuous engagement. This will only be possible when all stakeholders take part in the process. And when I say stakeholders, it includes all of you present here today. A conference like this plays an important role in this respect. I would like to commend the, commend the authors and everyone involved this evening, and I'm looking forward to gaining some excellent insights from all participants. I thank you very much. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. Uh, so my name is Norimasa Morita. I am the uh, Vice President for International Affairs at Waseda University, Tokyo, Japan. I am delighted to offer a uh, few words of welcome uh, for this prestigious public event held in the partnership between uh, San El El ULB and then the European Arch Union Institute in Japan at Waseda, EU IJ in Waseda. Waseda is Japan's most internationalized university and also has the most comprehensive ties with Europe. We have signed exchange agreement with more than 100 institutions in 23 out of 28 EU member countries. Each year, over 200 Waseda students study abroad in the EU for one year, and then further 250 students visit Europe for short program. And Waseda also accepts more than 200 students from EU countries each year. These figures are the highest among universities in Japan. Waseda also currently hosts an European Union Institute an European Executive Training Program, and an Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. Nevertheless, as a dedicated Europhile, I am personally committed to the idea Waseda should develop and then extend its tie with European universities still further. You could say I am interested in a pivot, or the rebalancing of Waseda's focus towards Europe. In a famous speech in Japan in 2006, former president of the European Commission, Barroso, remarked on the untapped potential in EU-Japan relations, noting, although that the relationship was already impressive, much more could be achieved. With regard to the academic ties between the two politics, polities, I strongly share the sentiment and would like to establish a network of double degrees with distinguished European universities. We recognize that teaching of European studies and EU studies could significantly improve and expand it, both within and between Japan and in the EU. Accordingly, it is Waseda's intention to open a new European center in Brussels in partnership with the ULB and develop and administer joint teaching and research programs. Indeed, today's event is intended to celebrate the publications of a new book, The European Union and Japan, a new chapter in civilian power cooperation. This book is published in Globalization Europe Multilateralism series, which is one of the many products of Green FP7 research project, Global Reordering Evolution Through European Networks. From Yerve, we are at Waseda. would also like to thank Mario Tero and San Frederic Ponyat for their tireless efforts in making the project and the book research and striking successes. I am also very pleased to have the coordinator of this new book on EU-Japan relations 
Paul Bacon, and then Hidetoshi Nakamura, uh, Waseda professors. And we are all, of course, extremely grateful to President Van Rompuy as and for providing us some deep, some providing us and forward for the book and graciously agreeing to participate in this event. President Van Rompuy's uh, affinity for Japan, addressed by other speakers, is very well known and deeply appreciated. We hope he will continue to develop his engagement with Japan. We are keen to explore ways in which this might be possible with him. Let me conclude my, by saying all of the things I have mentioned above provide us a wonderful platform from which to move forward together towards us and even closer and the more fruitful institutionalizations of relations between Waseda and UAB. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, Mr. Director, Mr. The Vice President, thank you so much for these interventions. We will now listen to Professor Hartmut Meyer from the University of Oxford. We will then listen to Mr. Hermann van Rompuy, former president of the European Council, for the keynote speech of this evening. Mr. President, just one year ago, on the 29th of April 2014, we had the honor and the pleasure to have you here at the university to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the uh, Institute for European Studies. So thanks a lot for being here uh, once again at the ULB. I haven't seen this picture before, but it's a really, it's a really nice design. I can, I can assure you, these are my books, and this is my college, and this, I think, is me. If you can recognize me, that's, that's me. So, so thank you very much. I'm extremely pleased. I'm extremely pleased to be here, um, back in Brussels, here at ULB, at the Institute for European Studies, doing an event with my friends from Waseda, and from ULB, and I've been collaborating with both institutions for a long time, and I'm very happy to be back. And I'm very happy to be back in Brussels, and thank you to the Wiener Anspach Foundation. I was a visiting professor here before, and for all the work that you do for Oxford University, and I have to say for the other place as well, but since I'm a Cambridge graduate, I don't blame you. I'm also very, very grateful to see the co-editors of the book, and the book wouldn't exist without all the contributors, and Paul Bacon and Hidetoshi Nakamura were excellent collaborators. I would also extend my thanks to, in particular, Frederick Ponja and Mario Tello, who has built this network for a long time, and I can tell you as an outsider, the Institute for European Studies is recognized as one of the leading institutes, as the pillars in European studies, and we all Love to come here. You have a slight advantage that you're close to the institutions, but it's also the intellectual content that you have provided over such a long period of time that always makes us happy to come back. Um, having said that, I got marching orders, of course, from um, Frederick and from Mario, and I'm supposed to introduce Hermann van Rompuy to Brussels. I thought that's introducing Pelé to football or the Beatles to Liverpool. The, um, the Prime Minister of Belgium and the former President, I don't have to introduce. What I thought I'd introduce is how President von Rompuy is related to the book that um, has been mentioned many times. And it was in April 2010. And I'm standing here, when I say April 2010, this is five years ago, I'm standing here being relieved and happy at the same time. Whoever has done a book is relieved when it's finally out. And I'm very happy because at the beginning of the process, this was when President von Rompuy, Barroso, and Kathy Ashton at the time came to the 19th summit, EU-Japan, and there was enthusiasm with the new Japanese government that a new chapter can be opened. And we took this as an inspiration 
to do the book. We had worked on the subject before, but we took it as an inspiration, saying we need to do something. In line with what the ambassador said, that civil society and everyone has to get involved, we thought we'd write a book which is addressed to academic audiences, but also to diplomats, to also to politicians and civil society. And that's what we are trying to do with the book. And I'm glad that we have representatives of all these constituencies in the room here today. Um, in the beginning, there was Hermann von Rompuy, and I'm glad he is here today when we finally launched the book. There's a cycle, and we are very, very grateful. And as many speakers before me said, his commitment to EU-Japan relations, his political leadership over the last five years and before will always be remembered, not only in the circle between EU and Japan, but his contribution that he made in his prominent role. Historians will judge, but um, it was a difficult task in the crisis, and it was a job that was excellently done. And I know a lot of people who appreciated what you have done as a committed European in that difficult role. So it's a great honor for us to have you here to launch the book. Now let me talk about the book. The book, as I said, tries to analyze EU-Japan relations. It's timely, as the ambassador said, but we don't think it is here for today. It is here to last. Because the design of the book is to put EU-Japan relations into the context of a fluid global order. And we have an excellent chapter by Mario Tello on the changes of European order, and we put the EU-Japan relationship in the context of the order. I see a lot of young students. I remember when I was an undergraduate, the Berlin Wall came down. That's a decisive moment. When I was a PhD student, there was 9-11. When I was teaching, there was the Euro crisis. And whenever you have events like that, you think about the consequences for global order. And I think we are at the moment, and you might not have realized it because it's not the wall coming down, it's not buildings falling, it's not stock markets crashing, but we are in a moment where we see a geopolitical change. And I don't want to refer too much to the crisis in the Ukraine, in Syria, ISIS, and so on. But we are in a moment that you will remember in the future as 2014, 2015, a decisive moment. And we have to reflect about key strategic partnerships and the changing nature of global order. There is a chapter here which looks at competing visions of European and global order. I don't want to go into detail. You can read it when you bought the book. But what is important to emphasize is that the EU-Japan relationship will remain to be a central anchor of stability in a global order. But that's the macro picture. Having established that, we then thought also, how do we conceptualize this? And if you are Joe Nye, whatever you write, people read. If you're a young emerging scholar, in order to be read, you invent a new term. Everyone cites you. And when we look at European power, you find normative power, transformative power, soft power. You even find metrosexual superpower Europe. We decided we are not young enough to establish metrosexual superpower. We go back to an old concept of the civilian power, which we still think and argue throughout the book, is what captures um, the nature of the engagement that both Japan and Europe have in global affairs. But then we said, well, let's break it down along the lines of the ambassador saying that it's the day-to-day cooperation, it's the mutual learning, it is the joint responsibilities for, for global challenges that bring these two sides together. And we have respective chapters, and I recommend, needless to say, to read the book. Some people might buy it, but if you go to the library and read it, that's also appreciated. And we have books on security, for example, on cooperation, which people have overlooked in the Balkans, which existed. We have chapters on food security, on biodiversity, on mutual learning about the environment. Of course, the disaster in Fukushima plays an important role on both sides, and we show how each side can learn from another and then translate that into joint responsibilities for global challenges. Center of the book is, needless to say, the trade relationship the comprehensive political partnership that my previous speakers here have alluded to. And there is sharp analysis about European strategy on 
trade relations with Asia, on trade between these two countries, on the potential, on the untapped potential, on the realized potential, and we have chapters that, that bring that together. So, needless to say, I recommend reading it. I recommend to my academic colleagues to put it on their reading lists. And um, to the audiences that are not in academia, there might be an inspiration here and there to learn from it. Now, coming back to President von Rompuy. As I said, in 2010, we observed his initial stages and then what he achieved over his presidency. I had the chance to meet him for the first time in Ambassador Katagami's marvelous house in January. And this was, for me, the best combination of Europe and Japan, a beautiful European building, Japanese food, classical European music on a perfectly functioning little tiny white roboter piano from Japan, and we had a wonderful evening, and I got to know um, the ambassador, but also President von Rompuy, and he recently came to visit Oxford, and he gave a speech in the Union, and as he told me then, he expected a very critical audience, but he was surprised it was critical, but more fair than one could have expected in the current climate, and then we had dinner and um, talked across the themes, but EU-Japan was very much part of it. And I got to know him as someone who is intellectually very, very sharp, very experienced, a committed European, someone of a politician who represents the people and takes responsibility. I have great admiration for Hermann van Rompuy, not only because of his achievement, but what I've seen from him in the three or four private meetings we had, and I'm extremely grateful, personally as well, that you came to support us with the launch of the book, and I leave the floor to President Hermann von Rompuy. Thank you. Mr. Ambassadors, professors, editors of the book, uh, Professor Bacon, Professor Meyer, Professor Nakamura, contributors, I welcome especially my old friend, Professor Taylor, organizers of uh, this event, of the Institute, ladies and gentlemen, and dear students also. I have to be flattered once a day but uh, it happened already three times this evening. Uh, so uh, I have a very good day. I have a very good day. Thank you. It is a pleasure for me to attend the launching of this book on, and that's the title, The European Union and, and Japan. Reading the book, you will discover that it is also about Europe, on the one hand, and about Japan, on the other hand, without the end, without this reference to the relationship. You will also discover that it is also about the world. So the book deals with a wide range of topics beyond the EU-Japan relationship, how important this relationship may be. Japan and the EU are both becoming more active on the world stage. Of course, we, we live in a global economy. We have to accept and promote this interdependence. It obliges us, our, economy, our economies, to be more competitive. Globalization will prevent stagnation. Openness is the only answer. Trade, free trade, is a necessity, not only for the world, but also for our economies as well. And we became also more active because we are living, as Professor Meyer said, we are living in a more dangerous world. More dangerous compared to a few years ago. The Union is surrounded by countries at war. In our eastern neighborhood, Ukraine is the victim of destabilization and war. It all started with the refusal to sign 
the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. The direct motive for the conflict was the EU. On our southern neighborhood, there are war and barbarism from Afghanistan to Nigeria. Human tragedies in the Mediterranean also are a consequence of those wars. We have to work together in this dangerous world. We may not overreach, being only inspired by fear or panic, but we must remain vigilant. And that's why we see a renaissance of the so-called West, not out of fear or in the style of the Cold War, but as a normal reaction of like-minded countries or entities which want to maintain their values, their interests, their territorial integrity, their view on a world order based on the rule of law. All this brings the EU and Japan closer together. We have a lot in common. Also, unfortunately, our economic problems. And we learn from each other's mistakes. The European Union will avoid deflation, but has to do more to avoid secular stagnation. We are saving too much and not investing enough. It is as simple as that. Japan and the EU are becoming biologically, biologically old societies. In times where innovation and creativity will be needed in a highly competitive global economy. And as you know, your most creative period are in your 20s or in your 30s. Afterwards, you can be very active, but before you are creative. We both are engaged, ladies and gentlemen, in the fight against climate change in EU and Japan. In the three disasters in Japan, I mean, those, the, the three disasters are a tragic signal for our leaders. And in an interdependent world, it changed also energy policy in Europe. The EU showed its solidarity three years ago, at the occasion of the three disasters. And Japan showed its solidarity in the current Ukrainian crisis. We are in the same boat, economically and politically. And we need even more to be in the same boat, even if we didn't draw the conclusion sufficiently in the past. There is, and it is already said here on many occasions, there is the so-called untapped potential, famous word of President Barroso in 2006. But let's develop it, and we are developing it. We are entering in a new phase of the history of the world, more global, but at the same time, more dangerous. Let's face it without fear, without overstretched enemy thinking, but with openness, a cooperative spirit, spirit in the first place with our friends and our allies. I notice this spirit in the way the relationship EU-Japan is evolving and the ongoing negotiations on trade and political cooperation are a striking example. Japan is changing, the European Union is changing, our relationship is changing. I think we are on the right track. Coming back to the book, since I contributed the foreword to the comprehensive and inspiring book with this title, the full title was The European Union Japan, a new chapter in civilian power cooperation. Since I uh, wrote, has contributed this forward in November of last year, just before leaving my office, I am glad to know that some further steps have been taken to promote the cooperation between the Union and Japan. Foreign Minister Kishida paid a visit to Brussels in January of this year, which was significantly the first one after his reappointment. During this visit, he sketched out a program for bilateral cooperation for peace and stability, for addressing global challenges, and for fostering economic partnership. 
The Strategic Partnership Agreement and the Free Trade Agreement, which are under parallel negotiation between the EU and Japan, will form the solid base for this bilateral cooperation. They will replace the elapsed 2001 EU-Japan Action Plan and the 2001-2011 decade of EU-Japan cooperation. Therefore, the speed and intensity of the negotiations should be enhanced without, of course, reducing the level of ambition. These agreements will be a classical win-win situation. The European Commission assessed that the free trade agreement with Japan, with our seventh largest trading partner, could boost the Europe, uh, European GDP by 0.75%, uh, create additional 400,000 jobs, and increase exports by one-third, while Japan's export could increase by at least 25%. Although these figures might need some adjustments because of the economic slowdown, the total trade volume of 107 billion euro in 2014 warrants such an effort. The nature of the agreement will necessitate difficult negotiations in addressing non-tariff barriers, the opening up of public procurement markets, geographical indications, automotive standards, to name only a few, not to mention the traditional hardcore items in the realm of agriculture. In negotiating the strategic partnership agreement areas like data protection, cyber security, arms export controls were addressed. The more difficult issues of the institutional setup and the linkage between the partnership agreement and the free trade agreement will be addressed soon. Preparations for the upcoming EU-Japan summit in Tokyo, the first one for me not to attend in the last five years, are underway. By the way, I will be in Tokyo. I will be in Tokyo at the same moment as the summit. But in my case, on the invitation of the International Haiku Association. <laughs> and officially, and I'm now quoting officially, as the Haiku Ambassador for Japan-EU Friendship. I introduced a new concept in diplomacy, the so-called Haiku Diplomacy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the summit should give political impetus to these negotiations in taking a long-term and strategic view to avoid getting bogged down in technicalities of vested interests. Such an impetus is necessary to demonstrate that the Union and Japan can achieve concrete results through cooperation, deeds, not only words. In an environment where news about the setting up of a multi-billion dollar Asia Infrastructure Development Bank, about the Silk Road Trust Fund, and the 60th anniversary celebrations of the Asian African Conference in Bandung, the famous conference, well, in an environment where is, this is dominating, good news from the EU and Japan would be of importance and carry a special political weight. Further, strong signals from the summit should underline the common commitment to achieve an ambitious agreement on climate change in Paris later this year. Linked to this goal is the post-2015 development agenda, where the EU and Japan, as the most important donors of development aid in the world, pursue common goals. For post-industrial powers, the Research and Innovation Partnership plays a particularly important role. This should help both the EU and Japan to realize the important goals of generating growth, competitiveness and thereby employment. Our agenda, the Europe 2020 agenda, and the abenomics for short, making common cause at the next G7 and preparing the G20 are other important issues for this summit. Sharing common values, Japan and the EU need to uphold the rule of law and the virtues of civilization. Therefore, facing the terrorist attacks in Paris and Tunis, the terror spread by so-called ISIS, 
The EU and Japan need to cooperate closely in fighting terrorism as well as its root causes. Geography is no protection in times of globalization, as Japan unfortunately experienced when her hostages were brutally murdered. The 2016 Japanese G7 presidency could include this important issue. Preparing the work program for this event and other important international conferences and meetings offers an opportunity to further develop policy cooperation between the Union and Japan. The ASEAN meetings, the Asia-Europe meeting, which is bringing Asian and European leaders together, but also people together, is another important meeting where we share the interest of rendering it more effective and better now. Having chaired the last meeting in uh, October in Milano, I am convinced that the informal exchange of views, as practiced for the first time among leaders in a retreat session, is an important contribution to the interregional inter relations. And I'm glad to note that the EU-Japan relationship over the last years has become comprehensive. In addition to the previously dominating trade and economic agenda, it includes now politics, security matters, and the people-to-people -people dimension. As civilian powers, I think the question mark in the title of the book is no longer warranted. The EU and Japan share a special interest to work towards human security in both its forms, freedom from threat and freedom from want. Unfortunately, Japan and the EU share hot neighborhoods. I mentioned it already. In today's interconnected and interdependent world, we all have to stake in the other's neighborhood. Japan follows the development of the Ukraine crisis, condemns the illegal annexation of Crimea, and participates in the sanction policy against Russia. Japan also has a stake in the Middle East and the developments in North Africa, Europe's neighborhood. And the EU pays close attention to the situation in the East and South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, Northeast Asia in general, and the situation on the Korean Peninsula in particular. Any major security incident in these regions would have direct repercussions on the European Union. Consequently, the Union supports actively confidence and trust-building measures. And we know, therefore, with appreciation, the re-engagement of Japan and China after the APEC summit, the reconvening of the trilateral foreign ministers' meeting between also Japan, China and Korea. From the various anniversaries of this year, the seventh anniversary of the end of World War II in the Asia-Pacific is standing out. As we know in Europe, dealing with the past and its legacies is never easy. One needs to find a delicate balance between the past and the future, humility and real remorse, leading to forgiveness, which creates the will and the energy to build in common a better future. And last year, we commemorated the outbreak of World War I, and I took the European heads of state and government, the members of the European Council, in June to Ypres, the Flanders fields where million soldiers were wounded, missing or killed in action. Chancellor Merkel and President Hollande were standing next to each other, together with the other 26 European leaders as guardians of peace. Symbols of messaging are important in building an international environment of trust and confidence. In this context, the speech of Prime Minister Abe on Capitol Hill yesterday is a strong historical signal as well. In recognizing that never ever again written over war cemeteries was rendered futile by the catastrophe of the World War II, we changed from alliance building and the balance of power to European integration. The European Union has changed the continent and made it possible for Europeans to experience stability, security, prosperity, and hopefully for a lasting peace which can never be taken for granted but needs daily engagements and devotion. This is the concrete 
emanation of the EU's civilian power and was the prime reason for granting the European Union the 2012 Nobel Peace Prize. This recognition, reflecting the positive attitude of its neighbors, allows the EU to be an active international actor, to move from soft to smart power in pursuing its non-traditional and traditional security interests. I'm convinced that there is an, again, untapped potential for security cooperation along these lines between the Union and Japan in areas of common interest, inside and outside of Asia, of Asia, for example, over Iran, the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and issues connected to instability in areas of Africa where cooperation at the Horn of Africa has already proven itself through operation and training. And recent joint maneuvers of European and Japanese vessels engaged in the area proved the engagement and generally cooperation of the two civilian powers will not raise suspicions. In light of Japan's renewed efforts to play a more active and independent role in foreign policy in the face of competitive and volatile environment in East Asia, the relevance of the European Union for Japan has increased. And furthermore, the EU's principled policy of advocating the rule of law in maritime and territorial dispu disputes also aligns with Japan's interests as well as those of other states involved. The two mentioned agreements under negotiation offer Japan and the Union to remedy a shortcoming, often referred to in the book, namely to define a coherent policy in relation to each other in order to add a sense of purpose to the relationship. This would help overcome an expectation deficit in the EU-Japan relations. For instance, the mutual perception that the other partner either cannot live up to its announcements or pursues security interests which are not of major concern to the other partner. The Union and Japan have come a long way, changing the relationship from one dominated by trade disputes to a more comprehensive one, where the lack of disputes has been equated by, the, by authors of the book with a relationship of benign neglect. Through joint actions, Japan and the Union can influence world policies sustainably, contribute to the formation of rules on global governance and through agreements to the formation of standards. This could reinforce Japan's special status as a strategic partner of choice of the Union and bind the Union and Japan into an institutionalized framework as nations that share common values. Working towards peace, security and stability in the respective regions and beyond, in particular Africa, could translate shared values into common policies and actions. Ladies and gentlemen, this would tap the relationship untapped potential, particularly if supported by a common public diplomacy effort. The book we are launching today is part of these efforts. May it have many readers to inform their recent views. And I end with conveying my most sincere congratulations to the authors of their, their, these brilliant contributions. Ladies and gentlemen and dear authors, I'm a reader and I'm a supporter. Even. Thank you. First of all, thank you to all the speakers, and in particular to President Van Rompuy. As announced, now we have a unique opportunity for anybody in the room interested in EU-Japan issues or in the EU's external action and its strategic partnerships to have here a panel with both some experts coming from Asia, Professor Nakamura and Professor Paul Bacon, as well as Professor Hartmut Meyer from Oxford, the three editors of the volume which was discussed at length during the presentations, and obviously uh, President Van Rompuy are here to answer any questions you might have. 
I'll gather a few questions and then give the floor to the panelists who would want to get, answer any of the questions. So please raise your hand if you have a question and the microphone will come your way. Hello everybody. Um, thank you very much to the IEE for organising this. As a former student at the ULB and also former exchange student uh, in Japan, I'm really happy to be here. And also for the release of the book, which I am using for my dissertation at King's College London. My question is quite simple, um, but because of all the explanation that's been going on, I would really appreciate uh, if any of you excellence could enlighten me with this, is that would you say that the signing of the strategic partnership and um, the FTA would make Japan the most important partner to the EU in Asia? Uh, are there any other questions? I might want to gather a few before handing over the floor. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is Wolfgang Pape. Uh, I'm speaking on my personal self here. I am quite surprised about the title of your book, about the civilian power, because if you look at recent news, you might have heard of President Juncker talking about a defense union here, and you might have heard of suggestion in Japan that there is less civilian control over the so-called SDF, the uh, self-defense uh, uh, forces. And I wonder how far this goes against the stream of your book as a civilian power. Thank you. Uh, we might want to start with those two questions and then we'll go back to the floor. Would important partner for the Europeans in Asia. I'm not the politician. He's the politician. <laughs> I would be very reluctant to say one is the most important because we have many partners in Asia and they have different sizes and they have different strategic partnerships. On the whole, with Japan, in my reading, has been totally underestimated. And to say that it is at least one of the important partners and the one where we had the most standing good relations where we share values that we might not share with all Asian partners is as far as I would go in identifying the most important partner in Asia. Personally, personally, I'm a Westerner. I believe in the transatlantic relationship. I believe in the relationship that we have built with Japan. But I wouldn't go further than that. Maybe the ex-politician dares a different answer. Of course, uh, difficult to give you a straight answer. Uh, but uh, I give you a diplomatic answer, but I think a uh, sincere answer. There are three main players on the Asian continent, uh, and our, our, these are three, our three strategic partners. We have also Korea, of course, but I India, China, and Japan. With India, we share values, but not by far not enough interests. We are not even really uh, close to the conclusion of a free trade agreement. With China, we share huge interests, but not values. And with Japan, we share values and interests. That's my diplomatic, but I think very sincere answer. I don't know who wants to take the second question on civilian powers. Professor Nakamura? Thank you. Uh, just to add the uh, previous questions that uh, uh, Mario Tero and Frederick Poniat edited uh, another green series book uh, on uh, EU's foreign policy and where uh, three chapters on uh, India, China and Japan appears, appear and I wrote the Japan part and so please confirm what uh, President Van Rompuy <laughs> says and there is a difference and then I hope that the Japan is, has been, has long been 
uh, the like-minded partners, and then uh, uh, we shared a lot, and then we worked together a lot. And as for Papa-san's <laughs> question, uh, nice to meet you again. <laughs> uh, civilian power, yes, it depends on the definition. Uh, we, but of course, we were different. The EU and Japan were, is different, are different from uh, us in the 1970s. In the 1970s, we, perhaps we only, we only have had uh, military and economic capabilities to work together. Now we have uh, military capabilities uh, to work together. So uh, with the military capabilities, uh, we can work uh, constructively. And, but uh, the, the reason why uh, we uh, stick to this concept is that uh, the civilian way of using military capabilities is the difference from the traditional great powers like the United States or perhaps China. So that's what we would like to emphasize. And uh, even the Prime Minister Abe's uh, uh, proactive contribution to peace is pretty much in line with our established uh, acknowledgement or uh, understanding in the world as a civilian power. That's what we are going to uh, try to emphasize. If Paul uh, would add something. States like uh, individual people, I think mine may be working okay. Uh, states like individual people have many different sort of uh, personalities or attributes to their personality. And of course we're hearing a lot about the, the hard power dimension of relations, but uh, one of the arguments that we're making is that that's what makes it all the more important that we focus on the potential for uh, global you know, uh, cooperation over a range of different global governance issues to emphasize the positive, softer uh, dimension to relations rather than uh, the harder dimensions that are getting uh, more attention at the moment. Thank you. Um, for a second round of questions, so if you have any specific question for a member of the, par of the panel, please don't hesitate. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, David Fouquet is my name. Um, I've been an observer and an analyst of uh, EU-Japan relations for decades. Um, I remember being excited about the potential and the optimism after the action plan, after other phases. I remember uh, Prime Minister Hatoyama speaking about uh, um, European uh, traditions and experiences. And uh, as we've all said, there is still a lot of untapped potential. I hope your book would enlighten me on why some of this potential has not yet been untapped and perhaps uh, look forward to uh, reasons why there might be a change now. If so, could any of the speakers convince me that times are changing, things will be different? Um, Professor Nakamura has the chapter on the long relations, so I pass it on to him. And there are lots of beginnings and there are lots of disappointments. And is there a new beginning? Is there another disappointment? But Maybe. Uh, I mean, uh, perhaps the best, uh, uh, the, the, the best reaction about uh, the, 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 the working experience should, 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 should come from uh, President Van Rompuy, uh, how you were excited uh, when you met Prime Minister Hatoyama and how you were disappointed with him <laughs> about uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, the year of uh, uh, innovation didn't so smoothly come up. But uh, yes, indeed, I mean, there, is, there has been a gradual evolution. Of course, there is, uh, I, mean, I mean, 
the year 2011 for the Japanese is a tremendously bad year because of that uh, uh, March the 11th. And so, of course, there was uh, the stop there, but uh, we have, haven't have lost the momentum uh, of that uh, continuous, n no matter what the uh, government, uh, uh, how the government, Japanese government was uh, or, or was consisted, and uh, from the LDP uh, to DPJ led government and now LDP government, there was a continuity, continuous efforts for those uh, uh, more people in MOFA in the Jap Japan and uh, also the Commission and the EAS now uh, in the European Union side. There was a continuous efforts, and there was a gradual uh, piling up of any uh, substantial uh, cooperation. So uh, it's, I mean, fr fr from from 2006 when President Barroso told uh, untapped potential, and how much uh, potential have we uh, tapped? Uh, I, I cannot quantify <laughs> this, but uh, I think there was a gradual tapping efforts and then was quite successful, I think. Sorry. I was not an observer for decades, uh, so uh, we have a, a different experience. I can only say what I look four Japanese prime ministers in those five years. So I had not the time to be disappointed. <laughs> um, but what I noticed uh, in, those, in this period, uh, and it is for me more clear, for instance, in the predecessor, with the predecessor of President, uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, and of course with President, Prime Minister Abe also, uh, but that there was really a strong will to go ahead with uh, the negotiations on the free trade agreement. There were, Japan was demandeur, really demandeur. And the European Commission uh, was, let's say, really reluctant for all kinds of good reasons, because they want that these negotiations would become a success. And so they, Japan had to show that they they are serious negotiators, that they had the same level of ambition as, uh, as the European Union. And so we went through a scoping exercise and to other phases and so on. And when there were doubts and hesitation, I was the one who said to the European Commission, no, let's go ahead, let's go ahead, let's show the political will to go, to go further, and it worked. Uh, and with this Prime Minister, who is now in office for um, according to recent Japanese standards, quite long. Huh? Uh, they, they feel the same, the same drive, the same will to conclude. Proof, the, the, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Yeah. But if we can have this strategic partnership agreement, including the free trade agreement, then this will be a game changer in our relationship. A game changer. We are not speaking anymore on expectations, wishes, uh, even action plans, this is going much, much further. Uh, and this is a commitment to, uh, uh, to conclude successfully those negotiations and, and to bring really this relationship to a higher level. I think this will be uh, the, we will see later on, eh, but we will see in the relationship between EU and Japan that this is a milestone. This is, will become a milestone. You haven't to believe me. Uh, but let's, let's see, uh, uh, let's say, the result of the negotiations. Uh, I think we have no option. There we may not fail, as, as simple as that. Because this would be a catastrophe for the relationship. So it is either we bring it to a higher level, or, or either we go really downwards. And in the situation in the world, economically, and in terms of security, that uh, really this is not an, an, an option anymore. So we, we are condemned to success. So I hope that in, uh, uh, with another partner, and, but you will still be an observer, uh, that, uh, that you will notice at some moment in time that uh, yeah, after all the 
promises and after all the high expectations, we delivered finally. I mean, just to add to that, for me it's the geo-economic environment that has changed. It's TPP, it's TTIP, it is developments where it is necessary to conclude that. Second, on the domestic agenda, some of the policy areas where Europe and Japan can cooperate, the environment, health, food safety, thinking about demographic challenges, I think the time has come for closer cooperation. But I have observed the relationships for a long time as well. And I have seen the literature saying, this is the new beginning. This is the new beginning, 91, 2001, and so on, and so on. But for the reasons that President von Rompuy mentioned, I think it is a different moment, and we should, we should recognize that. And again, just very briefly, I think the question was, it's working out, yeah. <laughs> I think so, anyway. Uh, why has, uh, why have, have there been problems with uh, realizing the potential? And I think this goes back to uh, the question that was asked just now, there are uh, legal constraints on the use of force. Now, people have been focusing on the potentially negative aspects of removing those constraints, but of course, uh, we need to loosen those constraints if Japan is to be able to be the kind of proactive actor on security that President Van Rompuy was talking about. So it's not a one-way street criticizing Japan uh, with regard to issues uh, relating to the removal of these legal restraints. Mm. Thank you. Uh, as we are going to set another unusual precedent for an academic conference, we ambition to finish on time. So I will close the Q&A at this point. I would like to thank all the speakers, and I think this is a very good point to conclude, as the call for action and the importance of the current negotiations which opened, which was announced in the opening words by the rector, is reaffirmed in the comments and the closing comments of the panel, which see the current negotiations of the free trade agreement and the strategic partner agreement as the make or break issue of the day in the bilateral relationship between Europe and Japan. Also, the significance of the relationship goes far beyond both the bilateral and its significance for Brussels and Tokyo, as it is a significant case study and one that will impact third parties for both the role in the global system of Europe and Japan. To finish this, I hope, interesting for all conference, I will invite again the president of the institute to thank and close the effort. Thank you very much, Frédéric. Some very brief words to thank uh, very sincerely President Van Rompuy, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Kaishika Takami, Didier Vivier, our rector, our vice rector, Serge Jomain, our Japanese academic partners of Waseda University, and particularly uh, Professor Norimasa Morita. We wish to see this partnership as a starting point as a starting point, sorry, for a deepening of our uh, collaboration. The editors of the volume, of course, Paul Bacon, Hidetoshi Nakamura, and Ahmut uh, Meyer, Mr. Pierre Dassonville from the Tribune de l'ULB, and last but not least, I would like to thank two very important persons, namely Professor Mario Tello, who really invested in the EU-Japan relationship since more than 20 years, and Frédéric Pugnard, who made this event really possible, together with Johan Robrecht. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you. Tribune. 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 Tribune de l'ULB. Un point de vue. Un débat.